If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Hey, Chelsea, how are you today? I'm great, Sean. Pleasure being with you as always. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. So let's just give the listeners a little background. Who is Chelsea? What's her background? How does she get into real estate? And, and what are you doing today within, within that landscape? So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chelsea Garber. I was born and raised in New York and now am residing in Park City, Utah. So if you can see my background here, if you're watching, this is a Deer Valley mountain, my ski mountain right, right behind us. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, born and raised in New York, my actually professional background is in interior design and construction. Um, so that is ultimately what what led, led me really to multifamily is just a passion for construction and design, and um, you know, always wanting to be an owner and operator. That's awesome. And and the whole design thing, you know, the the big kind of buzz term in style of investing in multifamily right now is value add, and usually it's like you know, people talk about, oh yeah, we're going to put in some, you know, LVP floors, new lighting cabinets, hardware, blah, blah, blah. But they never actually talk about like, what is the method behind the madness, the whole like kind of branding, you know, what, why, why do that? What's the game plan? And I know that's where you come in, your company comes in or one of your companies comes in to play. So if you could just expand on that and why it is so important to actually have a game plan and not just go in there, you know, guns a blazing and just fix things just to think (laughs) you're going to get like an upside. So if you could jump into that, it'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you mentioned, I have multiple businesses. I'm a full-time partner at Greenlight Equity Group, and we are based here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we acquire largely C, B minus properties that require value add. Uh, and by value add, we mean, you know, typically they're undercapitalized. Uh, there's not the right, there's no management in play. So we'll come in and kind of clean up shop. And uh, alongside, we work with my design firm. So a fully integrated, vertically integrated is ROI by design. And what ROI by design um, stands for return on investment. Uh, we solely focus on these opportunities to increase your, you know, not only your profits, but uh, ultimately create beautiful living environments for your communities. And and I think it all starts with aesthetic and design. And it's something that is, I think, most definitely underlooked. Um, And, and, you know, really the niche is particularly, I would say the C class space where we can create the most value, um, uh, particularly on a budget. Uh, and our belief is that everyone should be able to be able to live in a place that is clean and safe and aesthetically pleasing. Um, as we all know, we're living in a very stressful world at this time, and nothing is more important than I think our home environment. So we create solutions for uh, property owners and, and their residents that are you know within budget targeted to your community, um, your demographic, and we come in and put together sort of a full exterior interior package of materials, um, as well as branding and signage and amenity spaces and furnishings, you name it. It's, it's really a turnkey, um, you know, company. Uh, and our, again, our specialty is working with investors because, you know, being an investor and owner and operator myself, we, we really understand what goes into making these properties successful. And, you know, really ROI by design says, hey, we're not saying to spend any more money. We're just saying within your budget, let us curate a look that is specific to your, to your asset and and just make sure you're getting the highest return on your investment. No, that's great. And it's, it's true. The pandemic has really highlighted that, you know, the home is kind of a sanctuary for people and Mm -hmm. They, they want it to be a place that they're obviously comfortable to go to, but proud to go back to and. And, and, you know, just a place they want to spend time. So if I was an investor, you know, I am an investor, but if I came with you to you with a hundred plus units, and I said, we need to completely rebrand this property. What are some things you would be asking me in my group of kind of like what, what you would need to know to try to like establish a new brand for that property? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, 
we want to understand what what your plans are as owners and operators. Um, we want to understand again your clientele. Um, you know what your what is your budget, and it really starts from the outside working in. You know curb appeal being number one. Um, you know like when you meet a person, there's only you make up your mind in a couple seconds of yeah. what your impression is. So you know everything from exterior paint colors to the landscaping, updated lighting. Uh, and of course, super, super important signage um, and branding. What, you know, you want to create a, a community. It has to be cohesive from not only the name, but the colors and the materials and the flow. Um, so we would establish that, uh, you know, what is the name of your property? Are you renaming the property? Do you have particular colors in mind? And we would go ahead and, you know, start with the outside and put together renderings with, you know, detailed finishes and materials. Uh, and and just get really in sync as to you know what we're creating here and and that falls directly then inside to the interiors you know um just because you know your contractor has access to gray lvp and wants to paint the walls gray that doesn't necessarily mean that's what is you know the best solution um and honestly i think it it's it's probably dated at this point we right. think and we believe that we should be translating luxury a class finishes into afford like all solutions, whether it's B or C class, um, you know, it doesn't matter what the dollar amount is, there's different finishes available within all price ranges. So, you know, that's sort of our goal is how can we be a little bit more forward thinking and conscious for, you know, people that might not be able to afford an A or B class housing market, but they can certainly live in a C class and still have the look and feel and, and that makes people happy and you retain better tenants and it just all trickles down. Uh, yeah. And you're right about, you know, it's, you got to start on the outside because people judge a book by its cover, whether it's good or not, that's just what they do. And you got to walk by a lot of things before you get into that unit. So if you're just starting with, if you think you can just upgrade the unit itself, it's not really the case because you're not going to get the right people to walk in from the beginning. So that's really important. I think that's where a lot of investors miss out. They just focus solely on the inside of that unit when they should be allocating resources to the outside, because I know when I drive up to a property, that's one, it's the first thing you see, but I already get a feeling when I see that property before I even step foot in the, in the unit that you'd actually live in. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Hey, if you want to add, go, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and, and, you know, just equally as important, right. Is to continue that, uh, that feeling throughout. So throughout the units, into the hallways, uh, any common spaces, just having a really cohesive look and feel and knowing that you really spent time and paid attention to some of these details, um, they can really go a long way. And, and like I said, you know, it, it sets your project up for success because when you go next door and the property manager has picked all the same finishes and materials for that property as they have all of their other properties, you know, what is truly setting your, your property aside? I mean, of course, your management, perhaps there, there's other factors. It all has to go hand in hand, but design is so extremely important to our, our day-to-day -day lives and well-being. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you a question on that. Cause you know, you're right. The grays are so in right now to the point, where, like you said, it's probably out of date and I see it. Like I have properties in the Northeast that are using mm -hmm. the grays. I have properties in the Southeast that are using the grays. So do you think it's smarter to not really like, I understand why they did it. You mentioned this. It's like, you know, your construction manager, your property management, they have this stuff on inventory. So it's cheaper to go that route. But do you think it's smarter from uh, a branding, from an investment standpoint to kind of, you know, brand based on the market you're in, not necessarily, you know, from the economies of scale that your management company has these resources or what they may think is popular? You know, I think it's kind of a twofold question. I think um, a lot of it is market specific, but most of the markets are trending in the same direction. Um, and I definitely agree. And I, and I know with our own properties is we're all about economies of scale, but we're scaling uh, on, on more forward thinking in the newer products, right? Not the grays and whatnot. So for example, uh, for flooring, we're, we're going gearing a little bit more towards something a little bit lighter, kind of more neutral. You want to call it grayish. You've seen yeah. it in a lot of these modern homes, the white walls, kind of like a lighter oak floor. Um, so replicating something that's a little bit lighter and brighter and cleaner versus, you know, dark gray floors, light gray walls, 
white cabinets, <laughs> gray box bash. <laughs> yep. um, but, but again, it, you know, it goes back to, like you said, a really great point. You know, if there was this economy of scale and you're in one market building a portfolio, you know, have your property manager contractor show you other resources of, of materials that you can start buying in bulk and, you know, do that for a couple of years and then change. There, there's, there's no need that everything needs to match, but um, that, that is a valid point. Yeah, I think that's a good point too. Like within that, that concentrated market, you can, you know, create economies of scale within just that market, which will help you financially, but also, you know, set yourself apart, whereas just doing it like nationally. Um, but you mentioned your units and I definitely want to get, talk about this. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe green light has over 500 doors now. Is that correct? As of this week, that that is correct. That's amazing. So we are have a large uh, and growing presence in Oklahoma City and Columbus, Ohio, which has been just you know we've got on this rocket ship in the last year and really taken off in, in both cities and expanding and um, you know turning around some distressed properties and you know, what are going to be great communities. And it's, it's really exciting to be a part of change on a, on a larger scale than what I've done in the past. That's so cool. And, and listeners, Tate Seamer, who's also part of Greenlight was on, I believe the third episode of this show. So if you haven't listened to that one, go back. It was a great one. But I, so I've known Tate and Chelsea for a few years now and last year went from, they went from 20 doors last summer, as in 2020 mm-hmm. to now over 500 doors in just a little over a year, which is insane growth. So how did it happen? I, I know that we could probably talk for a few hours about this, <laughs> but like, just give us the uh, kind of 30,000 foot view of, of what it took to, to accomplish that. Yeah, I, I will say there was, there was a lot leading up to it. It, you know, we didn't just get into multifamily and get on the rocket ship. There were lots of little steps, years in the making. Um, you know, Tate and I and, and Carl are also are, you know, yep. Tate and Carl are the founding partners of Greenlight. I joined Greenlight um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, I, funny enough, I had met Tate at Michael Blanc's conference two, two summers ago. Um, kept in touch. I was sort of new into multifamily. He was new into multifamily. You know, at that point we had both targeted some markets we were interested in and we kind of just kept in touch. And then when the opportunity arose this summer to potentially join forces, um, it's really kind of like when the magic started happening. And and I I attribute that to putting together a solid team. Um, You know, for the years prior to that, I kind of was going at it thinking I could maybe do it on my own or take down some smaller deals. And uh, what I did do is I built great relationships in the Oklahoma market with brokers and property managers and, and other investors. And I really set a foundation um, so that when we did have great deal flow and capital, it all came together and, and things took off. So, um, you know, a lot to get to where we are today, which, you know, I know some people talk about and others don't, I'd say more people do than they don't, but, you know, from the outside, I'd say anybody new getting into this is, you know, patience and persistence and just put one foot after the next and tiny bits of effort day in and day out. And, and as you know, Sean, it, it comes together and when it does it, it explodes. Yes. It takes a lot of patience. There's, there's days you're going to doubt yourself and question, mm-hmm. what are you doing? And then there's days where you're going to think you're a rock star and then hopefully you come to the happy <laughs> medium somewhere. Sometimes all on the, all on the same day. <laughs> yeah. Within like an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, Seriously. I love your guys' story and yeah, Tate and Carl are amazing people, both investors and just, just human beings. And as well as same with Chelsea here. And I think it's important to note um, listeners that like she said, it doesn't just all come together and you don't just jump on the rocket ship and it's all about relationships. And I can't stress mm-hmm. that enough. Chelsea, I think you said you built, you've been building relationships in that market, Oklahoma city for over a year and more over it, two, more, almost wow, two, two, two and a half years. Yeah. So she'd been planting those roots in that market. And that's what I really like what green light is doing. There's a lot of syndicators and operators that are just looking for deals in all the hot markets, but you, as you, as in green light have decided these two markets, Oklahoma city, Columbus, Ohio are the two markets you want to target and focus all your efforts on because they're 
great from a, a demographic standpoint. Um, great to find value add properties. They're not, it's still a competitive market. Don't get me wrong, but in terms of, you know, they're not these insane sub four, mm -hmm. sub three cap rates that you're seeing in some coastal cities. So I think it's really smart that you've focused on two markets and then you've built these like deep lasting relationships that are just going to feed you deals, feed you opportunities. So if you could kind of just touch a little more on how you guys kind of operate like that, like who are you trying to build relationships with and what does that kind of, of look like and how has that brought everything together? Yeah, well, we're like, you know, very obviously market specific. We do not look at pretty much anything outside of our two markets. Um, we don't even really shop in our backyard here of Salt Lake just because, you know, as you know, cap rates are so compressed. Um, there's just not the scale. Uh, it, it just doesn't really cross off, you know, most of our check, most of our boxes, I would say. Um, so by the three of us, and obviously we have, uh, in, in addition, we have some other people on our team that do some marketing and some interns and whatnot. We are just highly, highly invested as far as our time and resources into our markets. And when we do that, we can create strong relationships there. Uh, we visit our markets. We've become good friends with a lot of the people in our markets. And we we like doing business and we want, you know, people to know who, who we are. And, um, you know, we we're in the midst of, uh, we just closed on a couple of properties and uh, our, we're, we're working on our signage and branding and obviously ROI by design. My, my team is doing that. And one of the things that we've kind of like tagged is, you know, on our signage is like, this is a, a green light community. So, cause we're creating communities and that's really important to us is, you know, not just to have 500 plus doors in a little over a year, but to create really great living environments and, you know, great returns for our investors you know, those are the two most important things. Oh, that's huge. And that, that's smart to put the branding on, you know, each building because then you're, you're further promoting that branding. Cause I know you guys are going to do a phenomenal job from a management operations standpoint. So, and it's going to, you know, one day it's going to be like, oh, I want to, I'm in this new market. I want to live at a, a, a green light property that's managed by mm -hmm. them. That's great. I, it's awesome to hear you guys are doing that. And I think you know, more investors should do that. Well, if they're good at operating, maybe, maybe not so much if they're <laughs> not, but, uh, cause you will get that, but I know you guys are phenomenal operators. So that's very smart. And listeners just, we were talking about cap rates. And for those that aren't familiar with the term, it's simply just the relationship between the price. So the acquisition price, the price you're going to buy the property and then the net operating income, the NOI that it, it spits off just the relationship between the two. And we were saying, you know, 4% or less just means, you know, you have to pay up, you know, to get the certain amount of, of net oper net op excuse me, net operating income. Like I mentioned before, it's essentially a business. Each property is its own business. So you're buying that NOI and in markets like Salt Lake and, you know, your San Francisco's, New York's, Boston's, they're super low because it's like one, a competitive market because of just everything, demographics, people moving their jobs, moving there. So they'll pay more for that NOI than you would say in, you know, a market maybe like an Oklahoma or a Columbus or, you know, other, any other market that's not one of the top tier ones. However, it doesn't mean it's not a good investment. It's just what Chelsea and I look for and what Greenlight and I look for is we want it to be able to cash flow from day one, be mm -hmm. able to pay our investors a return from day one. And it's hard to do that when you get into those low of cap rates. So it's still a good investment if you have a different criteria. Maybe it's you're looking for long-term appreciation, then something like a Salt Lake, a New York, a San Francisco is a great investment. But if you're looking for cash flow, not so much. Sorry, don't mean to take up your, your, your <laughs> no, time on the podcast. No, not at all. <laughs> um, but what, what's next for Greenlight? Is it solely just to focus on within those markets, I'm assuming, and grow grow the door count? And Yeah, I mean, the, the team is growing, the portfolio is growing. So just really honing in on our systems and processes and, you know, fine tuning our relationships with our brokers and property managers. Um, you know, we're uh, next step is going to be hiring a project sort of coordinator, kind of like a high level executive assistant to come on board. Um, you know, after that, once we probably hit the 1,000 to 1,500 doors, we'll do, we'll, you know, asset manager, take some stuff off of our plate, 
Um, you know, it's really easy to get uh, caught up working in the business, not on the business. So we we have a meeting on Friday and it's been just be just talking about working on the business because we've all been scrambling inside of it. And it's so common in this business and like any, you know, small business. Um, so we're, you know, we're definitely expanding, uh, you know, not just our, our properties, and our portfolios, but sort of our mindset uh, and ongoing education, uh, learning something new every day. And, um, you know, just, just taking it one day at a time and thinking about the big picture. And, uh, you know, by this, I think May of 2021, the goal is to have a thousand doors in Oklahoma city and a thousand doors in Columbus. And Tate says it all the time. I say it all the time. Carl says it, um, you know, we share a vision, we share goals and, and we, you know, we say these out loud to be accountable. And, you know, if we can meet that, that's amazing. If we can surpass it, that's even greater. And if we come close, that's, that's great too. But, you know, that's I think amazing. setting goals is so important and, and updating your goals. That's amazing. Speak it into existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, and I, like Chelsea said, they do say it. I've heard Tate say this a lot on all different types of meet platforms. Um, and it's true. One, it holds, holds yourself accountable Two, you're putting out into the world. So people know what you're looking for. And I think that's so important and something that is extremely overlooked. Like if you constantly tell people what you're doing, what you're looking for, if that comes across their radar, they're going to immediately think of you. And instead of, you know, I, I always say when you, when you see someone, instead of being like, Hey, how are you? And you just say, good. You're like, I'm great. I am on a mission to get 1000 doors mm -hmm. in Oklahoma city and a thousand doors in Columbus, Ohio. One, they're going to be like, wait, what are you talking about? And then you can explain and it's further marketing yourself and, and getting your message across. But two, they're going to think about that and like, wait, I should connect you with so-and-so I know someone who owns some units over here. So that's a great point. And it's something yeah. I need, I need to get better on because our goal is by this time next year is to be at a thousand doors. Mm -hmm. So that's something I need to be broadcasting more. I, I highly recommend um, a book called the vivid vision. It's all about, you know, setting goals and living them and talking about them. You like, you want to get everybody on board with your vision. Cause then, like you said, they, you know, when it comes to mind, like, oh, I know Greenland's looking for a thousand doors. Like we need to, you know, they, they get excited too. So they want to help you get there. Right. And, and vice versa. So, you know, speak it, as you said, like manifest it and speak about it and hold yourself accountable every day. That's awesome. And I know you guys are going to get that target because you, you haven't missed one yet. So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the journey. Uh, yeah. There, if there's always, you know, like everything else it's like what, what you see on the, on the outside is good. And then behind the scenes, you know, there's deals that are falling apart that we've yeah. been working on. And, you know, so it's, it's hard work for sure. This is not a get rich quick business. Oh, no. This is a long-term, you know, again, I will say it over and over again, like patience and persistence wins this race. So, um, although we're scaling, you know, at this rate, uh, you know, we're doing so consciously and our returns are still always as important as ever as, as, as our residents. Um, so, you know, we kind of joke, we're like, we get paid last and the least Yep. Yep. <laughs> being a passive investor is the best seat in the house. So. In this market, it, it sure is. <laughs> yeah. I it's know people always ask me, they think they're like, I have had so many people reach out to me now that they've kind of seen some of the success that we've had and, you know, want to get into real estate and I'm happy to share the good and the bad, but I'm like, listen, if, if you've got 50 or hundred thousand dollars sitting around and a full W2 time two job, you're not looking to leave, like go invest that passively. <laughs> like, right, exactly. Yeah. You can get a way better return and less yeah. stress, a lot less stress. Totally. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's a great point. And something that needs to be brought up more because obviously from, like you said, it, it's not always what it seems, you know, it's the whole, that the duck is calm on, on the top of the, the water, but below the little feet are kicking, mm -hmm. you know, hundred miles per hour. And it's, it's true. It looks like sexy and cool to be a real estate investor. And, and, and for some aspects it is, but then there's a lot of times where you're not sleeping well at night. It feels like your, your hair is turning gray, which Mine, it's not just a feel, it's actually turning gray, but- uh, I can't see it from here, you're good by me. <laughs> <laughs> the angles. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things that takes a certain type of person. And But again, it's like, would you rather have, you know, 100% of a million or 10% of a hundred million? And that's what you guys are doing. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. not making a lot 
as much as maybe you'd like per deal, but you're, you're scaling to, mm -hmm. to produce the type of lifestyle that you want. And in turn, you're creating a great lifestyle for your investors. So my question is, you guys are scaling fast. Obviously you have a, a solid team within green light and you're going to be hiring, but just from like a management perspective of the properties themselves, you guys, third party property management in-house combination how, how do you how are you kind of dealing with the the scaling when it comes to that yeah so we are third property management all day every day um there's no plans to do anything in-house at this moment you know given that we're based in utah and our, our properties are in uh, ohio and uh, oklahoma they're although they're not too far um, we are not going to be everyday boots on the ground people so for us our most important member of our team is our property manager and we know them we like them we trust them and we're very close with them um you know so having them on board i think they're probably can be your best asset or your weakest asset and you'll know really quickly which direction it's going in uh, and i will say that you know as owners and operators, um, you have to be on top of them all the time, no matter how good they are. And, you know, that's part of our daily job. And at some point we will have an asset manager, but for right now, we feel as though we're still building these relationships. And it's so important to know the ins and the outs of our property managers and, and working closely with them. So they understand our standards and what we expect and, and vice versa. So, definitely, you know, third party property management. And, and they're hard to come by. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I had interviewed many in the market. Um, it, it's a tough business to be in generally, especially now with, with shortage of, you know, labor and whatnot, it's hard to find good people, but yeah, definitely super important. Um, I would if always, you know, in any market for anybody who's maybe new to the business, go interview at least three different property managers, um, talk with them through, you know, acquisition phase, have them help you look at underwriting and numbers and definitely get uh, reference checks. Um, go look at, if you're in their, in your area, go look at their other communities. You know, how do they look? It's going to be a reflection of what yours might look like. <laughs> so that kind of stuff, do your due diligence for sure. I couldn't agree more. Management can make or break a deal. It doesn't matter what you acquired it for or what your game plan is. They, they'll make it or break it. And Agree. Uh, you know, definitely interview multiple. Don't just interview one mm -hmm. and think, you know, this, this is your, your one to go with. You want to, you want to get many different perspectives and views and yeah, it's, it's very important. So, well, Chelsea, thank you for adding that, but I have two questions before I let you go. You've kind of hit on this one, but why multifamily real estate and what kind of life has it created for you? What kind of life do you see it creating for you in the future? And then I'll ask you the second question. You know, multifamily coming from a, you know, obviously a interior design construction. I owned multiple firms, both in, both in New York and Los Angeles, and was really focused on, on residential and sort of segued into commercial towards, you know, I would say towards the end of my design career before ROI by design came to life. And you know, being in the multifamily space, you're, you're able to impact so many more people on such a larger scale and across the nation. Whereas the single family was very specific to quite frankly, just wealthy individual families who I love and care for. But, um, this for me has just been so much more rewarding. So to be able to bring, you know, green light equity to the table and ROI by design and put those two together and create these incredible communities and opportunities is, you know, it, I couldn't have, you know, more than I ever dreamed of really, and just a great synergy. So um, multifamily and just the scale, the scalability, right. Um, you know, as, as far as not only, you know, helping others, but, you know, capital wise, right. At, at the end of the day, we're, we're all in this for, for, there is money involved. <laughs> so, you know, being able to create long-term uh, generational wealth, I think is for me, uh, you know, and passive income truthfully yes to go enjoy the things that we like to do yes and i think ski. our greatest resource ski, yeah, ski <laughs> yeah skiing horseback riding mountain biking um uh you know i was reading a book recently and uh, i think it was atomic habits or i'm not sure which one i've been reading a couple like rotating between a few and one of the things that they said is you know what do what do people want most and uh 
it's, they want control and, and you want control of your time, your life. And if you're in a, in a control usually comes down to, to money. So, you know, what, who's controlling what here and, and, you know, being able to have control over your time is, you know, is great joy and to get to, again, do the things that you love. So that was a long answer. No, that was a, <laughs> that was a great answer. And I think that hits on the point of the show, which is about, you know, financial freedom, yeah. how, how to build that wealth and that passive income, but you know, how to then put that money work for you. Cause it's not, you know, what you make, but what you keep. And I think mm-hmm. when a lot of people, you know, financial freedom, they think of it, it's, you know, it's that money aspect, but what it really comes down to is the time freedom. That's what your mm-hmm. real goal is. It's just the, the money part of it gets you to that time free, freedom. It's what, you know, provides that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that's, that's what I'm in search, search of. Mm-hmm. I want the time freedom and you know, the flexibility to do what I want with who I want when I want. Mm-hmm. So the last question pertains to that. If you could go back in time and tell your younger self one piece of financial advice, what would that be? I mean, it would have been start investing earlier. Um, my boyfriend actually was telling me the other day that uh, for for Christmas a couple of years ago, he started giving his kids, and they're a little bit older now, like 14 and 15, um, rather than extravagant Christmas gifts, they him and his ex-wife are taking money and putting it into like the stock market for them. I was like, how cool is that? Like you're yeah. setting out for success at, you know, an early age. And imagine if you had done that much earlier, right. Whether it had been as a gift or personally, cause I feel like we don't, you know, we have so much stuff and nobody needs all of this stuff, but how thankful would you be in, you know, 20 years from now and you're in a pinch and you need to pull money out of a market or out of a property or something for a health issue, who knows? Um, so to be able to have that nest egg and start early, and I know it's easier said than done because we're all struggling, you know, at a young age to just survive. But, you know, I would say, you know, it's like everything else compounds. So start small and watch it grow. That's great. That's one of my favorite answers yet. I think that's a great, that's a great idea. And I know, so, right. It's like, we're going to do you, that. <laughs> right. Well, one, it, it, one, it's going to provide them something down the road yeah. in monetary value, but also teaches them. Like put your money to work. Don't just go spend it on, on some material item. So I think that's phenomenal. And so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but where can the listeners find out more about Chelsea, Greenlight and ROI by design? Um, I would say first and foremost, probably LinkedIn, um, just Chelsea Garber, Facebook. Uh, you know, you can look up our, our business, uh, uh, glequitygroup.com for if you're interested in learning more about our boutique investment firm. Um, if you want to jump on and listen to some of the podcasts, the apartment guys, which Tate hosts is, you know, my partner, which is great. Um, and then ROI by design also, uh, you know, we're sort of all over Facebook, Instagram, uh, both my personal pages and business. And, uh, we work with investors nationwide on, you know, all size projects, nothing's too big, nothing's too small. So if you need some help there, we, we'd always be, you know, happy to engage and, you know, spread, spread the love and make another community. Great. Awesome. Well, I'll put all that in the show notes and definitely check, check Chelsea Greenlight ROI by design out and Tate's podcast is phenomenal as well. So give it all a look. Chelsea, I really appreciate your time and listeners will catch you on the next one. Thanks, Sean. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.